My name is Martin Rapp. I live in Titusville, New Jersey. And I've been locating and documenting these stone sites around New Jersey for about a half a dozen years. Much of my basic understanding of these stone features I've learned and developed through the help of NERA, conferences and field trips. And I really appreciate being asked to participate in this conference today. I wish I could have been more uh, articulate with, with PowerPoint. As Terry said, I'm a retired biologist and I spent my whole career outdoors. And through that, I was able to gain an understanding of the environments and the landscapes where we find these stone sites even today. My talk today will focus on how I've used LIDAR and landscape characteristics that I've looked for um, to outline the context of what I already understood about the environments and the topography and the basic geology of the areas I'm reviewing. You might already have a favorite site that you discovered in your local park or open space. And now by putting some pointers together, you uh, can preview LIDAR yourselves and perhaps find these new sites that have gone forgotten or unvisited for a long time. For the context of my talk today, I'm considering these stone features I'm reporting on to be of Native American construction. Well, this brings me to a very important consideration I give to each site I locate and how I approach or interact with each of these sites, either newly located sites or those that I often revisit. I consider these sites to be of Native American construction built with intention and spiritual purpose and thought. I've been told, and I believe these stone sites to be sacred and deeply important in the Native American peoples and their descendants to this day. These ceremonial stone landscapes are not of my heritage, but deserve all the reverence and respect, light-footedness and mindfulness that you would afford to your own special place that you cherish and that you hold special um, and important to you. So with this in mind, I'll show you pointers that I've developed and which I have used to find ceremonial stone landscapes in New Jersey. And these may not uh, have been seen for many years. LIDAR is a computer mapping uh, program using laser imaging, and it's often taken from low flying planes. And I'll glance over all that technical stuff and say that it takes pictures of the solid ground surface details without distortion from trees or vegetation. Even things like your house or your car, for instance, for some reason don't even appear. So what's left is a true detail of the ground topography, showing mountains and elevation as USGS topographical maps always did. But with LIDAR, you have to visualize these things of height and what's high and what's low, what's steep and what's sloping. You need to interpret those yourself here. High quality LIDAR is so detailed, it's what archeologists have been uh, using in many projects, finding the lost cities in the jungles of South America. For what we're discussing today though, stone features such as stone walls, stone piles, cairns, and features that might rise just a few feet above the flat surface can be revealed using LIDAR. LIDAR, although it's an incredibly useful mapping tool, unless you understand the context you're viewing, you might not understand the features you think you're seeing. That's why it's essential to cross-check all your LIDAR assumptions with other mapping forms as part of your computer studies, such as using Google Earth, which was discussed earlier, or air photography or historical air photos if you have access to those. All this work will help form a better, more accurate illustration of what's really on the landscape before you go out in the field to explore. And you need to go out and explore these sites in the field because that's the best part of what we do. And it's the only way to make a true assessment of these sites. Remember that LIDAR mapping is no substitute for your outdoor skills and understanding of ecology and geology, and mostly how the placement of these stone features fit in the Native American context. This LIDAR image has been the background for uh, the previous slides I've been showing and depicts one of the first CSL locations I located using LIDAR. This slide image has several CSL locations spread out over just one relatively small area. This is somewhere about one mile long from the left to the right of this slide. Generally speaking, 
what this LIDAR slide image is telling us is that that area on the left of the view here is high and rugged and mountainous. It then tapers out eastward to a relatively flat terrain. And in this case was, or in some instances would still be agricultural lands. The high mountain on the left shows some terracing or benches along the downward slope. And you can visualize two major cuts etched deeper into the ground surface. These are two streams which have eroded the soil and gouging out their stream channels. A quick study also shows as many walls in the flat agricultural areas. But you still need to look at these agricultural types um, for when you cross check your LIDAR with other source maps, such as aerial photos and those historical imagery, you quickly discover that these areas are perhaps forested swamps, long abandoned fields, which might have converted back to forest as early as the 1930s. And in those days, farming may have been a just a little more tolerant of stone walls or rock piles in the middle of their cow pastures. So area A on the left was the first CSL site I discovered with LIDAR, and it seems easy to see why. All these dots are glaringly obvious, curious dots scattered across and up and down the steep slope. However, a well-established network of stone walls also shares this same northern portion of the steep slope as it faces eastward. And I cross-checked this with aerial photos from the 1930s, and it shows this slope as treeless and open field. I know a little bit about farming, and this didn't make much sense to me, but LIDAR and a field check revealed both a house and a barn foundation on this hillside. Next, I noted the features at area B on the top right of the slide. These look like possible cairns to me too. What's more, maybe in the formation of uh, some upside down Big Dipper constellation. I thought that would be pretty cool. Again, I cross-checked with historical air photos and again, it showed it was old dairy farm. Last, I saw that linear row of possible stones in area C in the center of the uh, image. Perhaps this is something too, I thought. Maybe it's a stone row pointing to some important direction, I wonder. So off I went to check and here's what I discovered. Stone cairns covered the mountain slope in area A. This picture is just one example of the more than 125 of these cairns uh, in this CSL site across this hillside. These cairns are approximately 10 feet by 10 feet by three feet. I sure need to get back there to this site and make an accurate count of all these uh, cairns. The area B site, that one that maybe resembled an upside down Big Dipper or something, I verified that in the field and here's a photo of that representation. And again, these are cairns and they're nearly again, 10 feet by 10 feet by three feet. And I believe these to be of Native American construction. However, the linear feature in area C was in fact stone, but not Native American. Instead, uh, I think it was modern American. It was a row of recently placed boulders lining a driveway to a brand new house. So this goes to show us how important a field check is in your LIDAR assumptions. This picture is not from this location, but you get the point. Here's another example. Across the top of this image, you're looking at a divided state highway here in New Jersey, and it's cloverleaf or the jug handle U-turn. Take a quick glance and see what you see. I've highlighted and marked some areas of interest with arrows. The red arrows highlights a series of stone walls. Note how some are straight yet others meander, some following along the contours at the base of slopes or others at the tops of slopes. What I found interesting 
is this remnant portion of the stone wall that remains within the jug handle. New Jersey is one of the most developed and congested states, yet here, Amongst the development and road system are old stone walls still remaining in this jug handle. It's incredible here in New Jersey. South of that jug handle, the orange arrows point to a series of well-formed dots. Note the shading on each of these dots. This shading suggests that the dots have height and a symmetry about them and their roundness and their dome. You might also note that one of the dots has a divot in its top. I've drawn a little yellow arrow to that one. Upon inspection, that was a, in fact an excavation or a digging into that dot. So in a close-up of that orange arrow, you can see how the dots are in fact cairns uh, and in this case, well, more of a stone pile. And note its symmetry being round and nicely domed. Again, have a quick look at this new image and what you might anticipate to be a CSL feature. Note the thin wavy line going from the bottom of the page to the top on the right-hand side. I'd point to it with my pointer, but I'm afraid to do that. But that is a Jeep trail and it just gives you an idea of scale. Uh, that Jeep trail breaks through a stone wall at the bottom of the image. So here's what I saw on that example. I've pointed out several different LiDAR features visible within this CSL site. But again, let's start by identifying what's higher elevations from lower elevations. The highest elevations is at the center of this image where the red arrows are located. Lower elevations are to the right side of this image, near the blue arrows. This is important in this example because although when, the, when I browse LIDAR, I noted the likelihood to find Cairns in, area, in the red area, I hadn't really anticipated the bumpiness in the blue area would also be Cairns. And that's because I suspected the blue area was forested wetlands. You see, trees in wet areas are prone to blow over easily because they have a shallow root system. They have easy access to water and don't have to have a deep root. And the resulting upturned root ball with its big clump of dirt and organic matter all attached to it can look on LIDAR as a bump and can often trick us into predicting these to be cairns. However, as I stepped through the break in the stone wall along that Jeep trail, it was obvious that this wasn't wetlands and these weren't upturned tree roots, but were in fact cairns. These were smaller ones, approximately four feet by four feet by three feet tall. Some were simply small boulders with a few rocks placed on top. I then turned my attention back to the high. Uh, hill site where the red arrows are. I looked particularly likely to be a cairn field to me because of these characteristics bumps, although not exactly as round as we saw in the earlier examples that I showed, but um, I didn't think they would be bedrock uh, exposures either. Also, the site bordered, is bordered by stone walls. And I've noted in many other sites I have found in New Jersey, Cairn Fields I found in New Jersey, that they're surrounded to some extent by walls or have wall features nearby. To me, these walls showed some interesting characteristics, uh, those being that the wall to the eastward side, I wish I could show you with my pointer, but I um, unable to do that now, to the eastward side, that right edge of the red cairn field was built in a wavy form, and it's not straight, and it's also closely follows a very sharp edge at the top of the slope. 
There are other walls here too. There's a zigzag pattern wall on the upper left, and also just other typical walls that show up on LIDAR. This red arrow uh, represents an example of one of the two dozen cairns at this CSL. This is a great example of a cairn. It's well built, five feet tall, with a base nearly 10 feet by 10 feet. These cairns were often sort of irregular shape, not those round ones we saw earlier. You know, I find that from a landscape or topographic perspective that in, in my findings, cairns are where they are and they ain't where they ain't. Like this site, they can be on a hilltop, but sometimes lower on a slope, sometimes in a hollow or a saddle between hills sometimes along steep slopes, or as we saw in the earlier example. Sometimes they're in stream headwaters and even in marshy wetlands, it's very hard to say. Another point to, to review in this image is the zigzag wall. Zigzag wall types are found throughout New England. Many of you have seen them before, and we have them here in New Jersey too. They have a regular interval sawtooth-like pattern to them. The photo on the right is an example of a zigzag wall, but from a different site. But you can clearly see when you follow that little yellow line I've marked that they have a regular and consistent length and a consistent angle that repeats itself in a zigzag, in a sawtooth pattern. This particular zigzag wall is very faint on the landscape. I simply point it out as a visible LIDAR feature you might look for as you uh, find walls in your communities. Lastly, you can notice a larger rounded feature on the bottom third uh, of the map. I've marked it. Uh, this is not part of the CSL, nor is it a mound or a cairn of any kind. It's actually a dug pit. It's from LIDAR, looking at the LIDAR, it's a depression in the ground. I believe it to be an exploratory mine pit, uh, likely looking for iron deposits. This is in the colonial time. These pits are found across much of New Jersey's northern counties where iron was iron ore was dug, smelted in furnace fires, and forged into the needed materials and hardware. But to cook that iron ore, you needed charcoal fuel. And before we had the, dis uh, the discovery of fossil fuel coals, these coals mined in, in our Appalachian Mountains, the unending fires of the early iron furnace and forges depended on consistent supply of wood charcoal to sustain the very high heats needed to work this iron. This slide shows several charcoal rings where wood would have been gathered and stacked in a tight like dome configuration, then covered tightly with packed dirt, and mud, or wet leaves in an effort to seal the pile to exclude any oxygen. The fire was lit and burnt slowly without the oxygen, and it burnt off the wood gases and cellulose, and if properly cooked, would yield bags of light crispy wood charcoal. That's, that's the carbon, that's the, only the carbon that's left in that wood. Because if oxygen or air had reached that fire, it would have combusted like in your own fireplace at home and leave you nothing but just dusty gray ash. Here we see at least three charcoal rings as they're often grouped together. The photo on the right shows how the depressed ring really looks on the landscape. And if you dig into the centers of these, you'll likely find bits of pieces of charcoal remains just, um, just right in the middle of that uh, circle. Well, when I first saw one of these rings on high quality LIDAR, my wife and I immediately went and drove off to investigate. We uh, were wrongly thinking that perhaps these might be ancient mounds or 
wigwam outlines. I hadn't seen them before, it was exciting. But they turned out as we hear that these were rings for charcoal. These rings are interesting to ponder in view of forest ecology and global climate issues today. As I read, charcoal or biochar as it's known today is a key component to terra preta. That's an ancient long lived and highly fertile soil amendment used by the Mayan culture for millennia. Uh, at last, I'd like to point out uh, and introduce you to the New Hampshire Stonewall Mapper Program. It's a crowdsourced citizen science effort to map the stone walls across the great state of New Hampshire using the aid of LIDAR. It's a simple, well laid out project with a short tutorial that gets you acquainted with the LIDAR program, as well as some interesting New Hampshire Stonewall history notes. I encourage you to try it out yourselves and get acquainted with viewing and understanding landscape level LIDAR. The column on the left uh, shows various map sources, such as air photography, various years of um, air photos, historical photos, tax maps, road systems. These are sources that you can cross-reference as you turn them on and off as you observe the stone walls. Here, you can see the pink or purple lines that other participants have drawn of stone wall segments. Some computer al algorithm tallies all these lengths and compiles them into a total mileage of stone walls. And dang, it's going to be a staggering number of wall miles for sure when this project is completed. And note that more walls are yet to be identified, such as we see here in the center bottom. There are walls that need a pink line on them. So I urge you to check it out yourselves for practice. Summing things up, uh, the use of LIDAR is a great way to discover cairns and walls of our ceremonial stone landscapes. These sites deserve your respect and light footedness as you go about documenting these sacred sites. However, since some people don't understand the significance of these CSLs, and to avoid vandalism and unwanted disturbance, I hope you'll consider keeping these site locations somewhat confidential to the general public. However, we have an opportunity and an obligation to share such sacred sites with your area's native tribes to help them rebuild their own traditions and restore an important spiritual link. In addition to those, you may consider sharing your CSL information with tribal nations. You might consider sharing these with your state or tribal historic preservation offices. You might want to consider coordinating these efforts with your state near a coordinator too. So thank you for your time today and your patience with my poor PowerPoint proficiency, but I hope I was able to share some useful LIDAR pointers that you might use in your own studies of ceremonial stone landscapes. Get up, get away from your PowerPoint and go outside and look for these yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. That was a great presentation. And uh, there are a couple of questions that have come in. Um, first one is, what era would the charcoal rings be associated with? I'm not a charcoal ring expert, but this would be our colonial times. I would say it's uh, 1700s into the mid 1800s. We didn't get coal here in um, northern New Jersey. That would have come from Pennsylvania, uh, mined coal. And I guess that's the Morris Canal era, 1900s. You might have started with um, fossil coal. And uh, how large would you say the charcoal rings would uh, normally be? Well, I think there is, again, I'm not a charcoal ring expert, but it's fascinating to see these. And I think I could uh, glean two different styles of charcoal rings. 
and perhaps it's from two different eras of making charcoal. Early ones might have just been built right on the ground in a mounded construction of just wood and then covered with dirt, like I explained. And it may not have much of an impact on the uh, ground topography. But looking at YouTube, which we learned so much from these days, I saw some old boy had a gigantic round um, cauldron, you might say, that, that was a big gigantic bunt cake pan that was then, fit, that was made of metal. It was filled with wood, had a wood, had a metal lid and that was sealed tight. Those are about 35 feet, what is that? Diameter is all the way across. Yes, radius is half, so diameter, 35 feet in diameter. And they're consistent. You can see those pictures that I showed, those rings are really tight, really symmetrical. Got a couple of questions that came in about the LIDAR uh, imagery itself and the data. Can you explain to us how we can actually access the data? I mean, actually download it and, and how- Yeah, to I would have liked to have done that better had I been looking at my slides better, but there was one of my slides that showed an access. I get mine from the New Jersey DEP, our Department of Environmental Protection through our GIS, Geographical Information Service, or our geological office. And your states probably supply that to the public too. These are government resources that you can get um, just online. And the New Jersey information is really detailed, very recent, LIDAR, and very detailed. Uh, on the slide, I showed something called DEMVIEW. That is a free program gotten through the USGS, US Geological Service uh, website. And it shows LIDAR from many, many places across the country. Dem view. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, now you have a second presentation, is that it? I sure do, Terry. What I'm talking about today is a pair of stone chambers in New Jersey that have gone what I think is unreported and today they have a questionable fate. So the chamber styles I'm talking about today are those that are made of dry laid stone and corbelled walls uh, of domed construction. And they're found throughout New England, but have seemingly gone unreported from New Jersey. If you already knew of these chambers or know of others in New Jersey, we should talk. Today's a quick report about a pair of dry laid stone chambers I found in New Jersey and their questionable fate. Stone chambers are known across much of New England and have their densest concentration of chambers in the lower Hudson River Valley, east of the Hudson, not too far from New Jersey. The origins and purposes of these chambers have generated much discussion and questions over the years. And we heard about some of that today but often there's no real answers or conclusions at this point. Some say they're simply root cellars. Others say they're ancient cultures. I say, I don't know. The map here in this slide is a snip clip of just a portion of, a, of the DeLong Cook map of stone chambers. And I found this on the internet. These dry laid corbel dome chambers have gone unreported from New Jersey. There is none reported from the NERA files or by longtime NERA members. I've recently spoke with Ed Lenick, a respected professional archeologist and a longtime New Jersey NERA member. And he wasn't aware of any of these uh, types of stone chambers. I also spoke with Nancy Hunt, our longtime New Jersey NERA coordinator and she wasn't aware of any such chambers in New Jersey either. However, the DeLong Cook map, which we just saw on the previous slide, does have two pin location for chambers in New Jersey, but no further details such as the lat long coordinates or descriptions are available. And it's possible that the DeLong Cook map is making note of a chamber already well described by Nira, known as the Sandiston Chamber. Ooh. 
the Sanderson chamber is really a very interesting chamber like structure, but it's not of the dry laid corbelled construction style that I'm reporting about today. The Sanderson chamber is best described as a split or a separation in the bedrock with a number of massive stone roofs, roof slabs positioned to span that gap. Uh, it creates a ceiling and it results in a shoulder width tunnel like chamber, as you can see in this right hand slide. The north facing door has even been considered by some to have significance in long distance linear alignments. There are other uh, chamber like structures in New Jersey. And these two examples are made of stone, obviously, but don't meet my dry laid corbel characteristics. The example on the left has a date stone clearly visible over the doorway. And the example on the right is in a backyard, it has a stone front, but a large walk-in door. And perhaps it was built as a root cellar or maybe a bomb shelter for all I know. I haven't explored the inside of either of these, so they might deserve a closer look. What I do want to discuss are these two examples. I'll call them chamber one and chamber two for the purpose of this talk. The pair of chambers are both constructed with dry laid stone, meaning having no mortar to bond the rocks together. These two chambers are approximately a quarter mile apart and would likely be visible or nearly so if there were no trees blocking that view. In fact, they both reside along the same road, which was reported to me from an archaeologist friend to be a likely Indian portage where Native Americans would carry their canoes overland between two rivers. Here are the exterior details of uh, stone chamber number one. It, like the other stone chambers, has a massive stone lintel over the doorway. The doorway is very small and low. In fact, you have to crawl through to get inside. Note in this picture that someone has recently positioned small stones placed in the doorway opening. Perhaps you're trying to keep kids from messing around inside or maybe to keep a bear out from hibernating in the, this winter. The door faces east, giving it a spring equinox sunrise opportunity. And in fact, I saw this occur in March of this year. The sunrise light shone in through the low doorway and lit the interior of the chamber to some extent. Um, if you see the slide on the right, it's a screenshot of a Sunseeker phone app picture. Here, I'm looking into the chamber. So the chamber indicates a winter sunset. But if I had taken the picture from the inside looking out, it would have in fact registered a spring equinox sunrise. This chamber is roadside and I chose not to enter in that morning. Um, and like so many of these chambers, there's a farmhouse and a barn directly across the street, which leads us to wonder if it's somehow related to the farmstead. Also, it's important to note a large complex of stone walls that exist above the hillside of this chamber, which is dug into the ground. The interior details of chamber one show a circular shaped dirt floor. Again, dry laid stone with a corbelled construction upper wall to establish that domed roof. Corbeling is a masonry technique of cantilevering one stone partly over the next, leading to an arch style situation. Here, that corbeling leads to a roof capped with several large stone slabs. I wish I had taken better notes and counted how many, but I can report that one was broken. Now to chamber number two. Remember this chamber is only a quarter mile away and it also um, is roadside, but not nearly as close to the road as chamber number one was. Its exterior is modified with modern mortar between the stones on its facade, but not inside. It has no massive lintel that's uh, evident anyway. Its doorway is well above the outside roadway and no obvious path leads to, uh, to it. And I had to make 
quite a scramble to climb up to get to this chamber. I know it would be difficult to haul a sack of potatoes or a bushel of rhubarb up the hill to store in this chamber. You can see the image on the right. I took this from the inside looking out. It falls off kind of drastically um, just at the brim of the doorway. There are some um, compass uh, directions in this photo as well. The circular dirt floor is on the inside of this same chamber. It has a, a boulder at the base of the wall where it meets the floor. That's an interesting thing that uh, I noted in reading a uh, book by Mary and James Gage, their handbook of stone structures. That was a real tip off there. And the chamber inside has a possible evidence of whitewash. Whitewash is a paste made out of lime and water, and it's um, sometimes made thin like paint, but you would apply it to a wall uh, to create a sanitary surface on the inside. You'd see it in a pantry where people would put up their canned goods. You might see it in a milk house to keep the milk and cheese in a, in a sanitary condition. But it was never placed very, efficient in this side of this chamber. There's still lots of cavities for rodents and varmint and grime to, uh, to impact the inside. So that seems peculiar. It leads us to a quite unanswered question. So there's a summary of those two chambers and what's the fate of these chambers in their future. So in the morning of that summer solstice sunrise, you can see on the left that the sun is just licking the top of the hill above that chamber. And as you looked out from the chamber, you would see the farmhouse and the, the barn right there and the sun coming up. And if it weren't for the spruce trees, you'd have a better view of that beautiful sunrise. But as the sun rose, I took a hike up above the stone chamber on that hillside. And the stone pickers were working on a hillside right there and they were harvesting these mossy boulders for resale to landscapers. Stone pickers had already messed up the area around chamber two, perhaps accounting for why the door front was uh, damaged, but that chamber still stands. These stone pickers use a big excavator and there's a articulating thumb on the, on the bucket and they use that to bust up the bedrock and to pick up these big boulders and place them in a roll off dumpster. And that makes it easy to haul back to their stone yards. It's sad for us to see these things happen. And uh, I had bumped into a local farmer uh, who lived in this area where these stone chambers are. And he reported uh, a similar stone chamber on land he owned, on a farm he owned. And he knew the chamber on the road because he grew up there and knew it as a boy. So he knew what I was describing and he, he reluctantly had to tell me that that chamber on his farm is now demolished and gone without even a, a photo. So what to do? These are on private property. And without um, doing full research on zoning regulations or getting up in somebody's face, the best I felt I could do was an attempt at education. So I went online and I ordered two copies of the Mary and James Gage's book, a little booklet called A Guide to New England Stone Structures. Very nice little handout, I, I felt. And I wrote a little note on it with a sticky pad. And that note said, it would sure be nice if you could not disturb the small chamber by the road. Thank you. So I thank you today for being so patient with my PowerPoint abilities, but I hope you uh, have learned something about uh, stone chambers. And, and if you know of any information about these types of stone chambers in New Jersey, I'd sure like to hear from you as well. Thank you for your time today.
Great presentation. Good work, Martin. Um, Thank you. We do have a question for you. Martin, perhaps some past deed for the property would include the chamber and give it a description that might hint at its use. Any of those things are possible. Research is so important in a lot of the places we study, understanding taxes, understanding historic deeds. Um, Greg Herman, our first speaker, went back to, you know, pre, pre-colonial time to get data and information. That's a lot of hard work. Important to do though. Someone else says to test that white stuff. It's uh, it could be ancient paint. Uh, white paint has been around since ancient times. He says. I'd like to know. That would be interesting to to know because uh, it didn't look like I couldn't explain why it was on some rocks and not others. Ancient paint. I like it. All right, so we're almost on time. Thank you very much. We'll call it quits there.